Volumetric effects are great for enhancing the visuals of your game as they can introduce a lot of depth and atmosphere to your environments. However, because these effects don't really adhere to the conventional way of rendering with vertices and triangles, they can seem a bit daunting. I for one didn't really know where to begin when it came to making a shader for volumetric fog. Thankfully, Unity's Europe makes the process quite less scary and hopefully this video will make volumetric effects a bit easier to comprehend. Welcome to Technically Hurry. Before we get technical, I'd like to thank my supporters on Patreon. My content output is not what it used to be, but I am extremely grateful there are still patrons supporting me every month. So thank you, truly. Now let's march some rays. First, we should talk a bit about the process of volume ray marching. For each pixel on the screen, we get the depth of our camera. Using that depth, we can recreate the wall space position of the current pixel. Then, we can get a ray going from our camera towards the wall space position of the current pixel. Now that we have an origin point and a direction, we can start moving at fixed intervals along the ray, accumulating density as we go. We can stop when we reach a maximum distance or when we hit an object. Let's see how all of that translates to code. First off, this is gonna be a full screen shader written in Shader Lab and HLSL. We won't need a custom renderer feature, we can just use Unity's built in full screen renderer feature. Here's the simplest handwritten shader you can use with this renderer feature. This will be our starting point. Right now, all it does is flip the colors of the scene. And that's not too volumetric. It could be a good idea to render the effect before post-processing, so additional effects can be added on top. Let's make our shader do something more useful. As we mentioned, the first thing we want to do is to get the camera's depth texture. URP provides a handy method to do that, but first we'll have to include another HLSL file to our shader. It's called declaredepthtexture.hlsl and it's in the same folder as core HLSL, so we can just copy the path and change the file name. Then, we can get the camera's depth using the sample scene depth function. We can return the depth to see if everything looks ok. Since we're getting this found footage kind of effect, it means the depth is being output correctly. Small tip, another good way to visualize the depth is to use the fractional part of the linear eye depth. It's a bit funky, but it helps see the shapes a bit better. Now we need to convert the depth into wall space position. Before URP, that was a bit of a tedious process, but now we have access to compute wall space position, which returns the wall space position of a pixel using as inputs the screen space UVs, the raw depth and the camera's inverted view projection matrix. We can also visualize the result to see that everything is in order. The fact that the values are stable as the camera and the objects move means that everything is working great. Now we have to set up some handy values. First, there's the entry point. This is the start of our array. Then, we figure out the vector between the wall space position of the pixel and the camera position. We will store the length of that vector, as that will be used to determine whether or not we have hit a surface as we're doing array marching. Finally, we normalize the view direction vector to get the direction of our array. Like we mentioned, we want our rays to stop either when they hit a surface or when we reach a maximum distance. We will have to define that maximum distance as a property to our shader, so we can tweak it from the material. Now we can define the distance limit as the minimum between the view length and that maximum distance. We could also use a variable that tracks how long we have traveled along the ray already. And we will also track the accumulated transmittance using another variable. We are almost ready to start the ray matching process, but we still need two things. To define a step size and also to have a formula to calculate the medium density in order to know what to accumulate. The step size will be defined as a material property, but be warned, you should clamp it to a range because you really don't want it to be a really small value. Regarding the density, for now we will assume it is uniform and it's only defined by a multiplier which will be another property. Let's add a function for it though, just so it's easier to modify later on. We now have all the ingredients we need, so let's march some rays. We are going to need a while loop and increase the distance traveled by the step size on each iteration. Then, we'll get the density and if it's larger than zero, we will add it to our transmittance value. We multiply by the step size so the overall accumulation is consistent across different step sizes. 
If we return the transmittance value, this is what we see. It is a bit bright though, so let's drop the density multiplier a bit. If you see these bands that get increasingly brighter, then that means everything worked. You can also see how the step size brings the bands closer together as it gets smaller. But that also means there is more iterations and therefore bigger performance impact. So this essentially qualifies as the most basic volumetric ray marching shader out there. Which means I could finish the video here. But I will not. There are a few things that we need to do to make this more presentable. First, while we have our fog, we are not actually blending it with the scene color yet. Second, the additive transmittance doesn't look that good, so we're gonna get fancy with it and use Beer's Law. Third, we are gonna get rid of this bonding, which will allow for better performance with some extra caveats. Then, we will add some noise to make the density a bit more interesting. And finally, we are gonna use some lighting information and colors to make it all pretty. Let's start with easy stuff, the blending. I'm gonna add a color for my fog to blend the original scene color with, based on the transmittance. Don't forget to saturate the transmittance value as it most likely won't be in the 0 to 1 range. Our original color is back and it's blending with the fog color. But now you can see how unappealing the cutoff from the linear accumulation of the density looks like. We're gonna fix this by accumulating the density using Beer's Law instead. It's nothing too crazy, we will just set the original value of the transmittance to 1 and then in each step we will multiply it by the exponential of the negated density. The resulting value will be inverted from what we want though, so let's invert the value of the transmittance afterwards. This is the difference between the linear accumulation and Beer's law. Just look how much smoother it looks. Now to take care of the bonding. A classic way of eradicating the visible bonding from the steps is to introduce a bit of noise at the start of our array. That way, each pixel will have a different offset from the starting point and the samples will blend better. In other resources, you will see that people prefer to use blue noise for this purpose, but I have taken a liking to interleaved gradient noise, or IGN, lately, which works quite well with temporal anti-aliasing and, as a bonus, there is a built-in function that we can use for it in URP. First off, let's add a property to adjust the amount of noise offset. Then, we will need the screen coordinates in pixels to calculate the IGN. We can get those by multiplying the texture coordinates of the pixel with the width and height of our bleed texture. IGN also requires an integer corresponding to the frame count. We can calculate that by dividing the time by the current frame delta time to get the current frame number. The noise will then be multiplied by our noise offset property. Finally, because divisions by zero are not fun, we should probably ensure that the delta time value won't be less than epsilon. Here's how it's all looking now. The bonding is essentially vanished. This allows us to further increase the step size of our volumetric fog, which is a great thing, because larger steps means less iterations, and that means better performance. I have found that I get the best results when I set the noise offset to be equal to the step size, as that syncs much better with the bonding. However, the more the noise offset gets increased, the more noticeable the IGN will be. Next on the list, break the uniformity of our density. Right now we assume that the density is uniform across the whole level, but we can instead sample a 3D noise texture to give some shape to our fog. First, let's declare some properties. We want to use a 3D texture for the noise, adjust its styling and also have a threshold value to cut into the noise for clearer shapes. We now have to extract the current wall space position we are ray marching into, so we can figure out what the noise value will be. The position of the ray at a given point will be equal to the entry point plus the distance the ray has traveled along the ray direction. We can now pass that value to our density calculation function so we can sample the noise. The 3D noise textures I'm using have values in all four channels and for this tutorial I'll just do a dot product of the values with themselves so I add the squared values of each channel together. 
You can choose to keep only one channel or use a weight vector to have some more control, but right now I mainly care about varying the fog density. By the way, you can check out Sebastian Legg's video on clouds for more information and to get some great 3D noise textures from his projects to use here. I will leave a link in the description. Let's see how our fog looks now. The density is no longer uniform and we get some nice little fog clouds. Using different 3D noise textures, overlaying them or making them move over time will yield even more interesting results. This is just the base to get started. The final thing on our list to justify our fog is adding some lighting effects. Since we now have the wall space position that our rake is currently at, we can sample the shadow attenuation of the main light to see if the fog is currently in the shadows or not. If the fog is lit, we can add some more color to it. So first, let's make a field for our final fog color. We then need another color property to tint the light color before we add it to the fog. Then, we will need to grab our main light. We'll need to include another HLSL file for this, called lighting.hlsl. Again, it's in the same folder as core.hlsl. Now, we can grab the main light like this. Passing the ray position in shadow coordinates will allow us to access the shadow attenuation of the main light. For each step now, we can add the color of the light multiplied by the light contribution tint, the density and the step size to keep the visuals consistent. So now our fog picks up the main light color, but it's all assigned everywhere, with no regard for shadowed areas. To fix that, we will have to multiply our light contribution with the shadow attenuation of the main light. But that seemed to do nothing. We will have to do a bit of shader detective work to figure out why, and Ryder's gonna help us with this. Let's start by checking out how the shadow attenuation gets assigned. It seems that we don't have a main light shadows related keyword defined anywhere. But because we can't be sure about what sort of keyword this is, we can pick at a shader that we know gets proper shadows from main lights. The default URP lit shader. And here we can find a pragma statement that looks quite like what we want. If we copy this and paste it in our volumetric fog shader, we can see that our fog is only lit when it's not in shadow. And that can give us some really pretty god rays coming in from the sunlight. But we can actually do one more thing to make the light scattering look even better. In other volumetric effect contexts, you might have heard of the Henny Greenstein phase function. It sounds fancy, but it's basically a way to control how focused or scattered the light will be inside our medium. I'm neither Hengi nor Greenstein, so I cannot explain how this works. I just copy and paste this method around. We will have to also declare a property to control the light scattering. Now all we have to do is multiply our light contribution term with the result of the phase function using our light scattering property and the dot product of the ray direction and the light direction as the inputs. This results in the light scattering being less uniform across the whole fog and it makes it more dependent on the view direction. It's cool if you want to get something closer to a physically based effect, I guess. This should be a good basis for you to get started with volumetric effects. You can choose to play around with more interesting effects for density, blend more 3D textures for more complex shapes, control the opacity of the fog and more. Something that is worth mentioning is that usually, for performance reasons, volumetric effects are rendered to off-screen buffers at lower resolution first, and then they are upscaled and blurred with some sort of depth-aware technique like bilateral blurring. This would require a more custom render feature setup though, so it's not within the scope of this video. I just hope this helped and I hope you will have some fun with cool volumetric effects. See you in the next one. Bye bye.